In this video, we'll go through a hypothesis test and we will put particular focus on deciding which test statistic to use and how that test statistic is distributed. And as you know, this is the crucial bits of information such that you can actually perform a hypothesis test. So let's look at the problem we are looking at here. We're having a problem or perhaps some of my colleagues, perhaps even including myself, we think that students may not be working hard enough. So we decided to investigate this. We are 10 years ago, so in 2013, students on average in the country studied 24 hours per week. Now, how we will interpret this is 24 hours outside of lecture and tutorial attendance. Okay, so they used to study 24 hours per week 10 years ago, 2013. A recent survey indicates that across the nation, students only study 14 hours per week. Okay, so that is 14 hours per week um, today in 2023. So what we are now asking ourselves is, what about our students? How much do they study? And we will be forming two hypotheses. The first one, that's in sub-question A, is, is the mean study time of our students below that of 24 hours per week, 2013? The second hypothesis is, is the mean study time for our students today, so the same object, is that different from today's UK average of 24 hours per week? So this is the problems we'll be looking at. So we'll do two parallel, two hypothesis tests and we do them in parallel. So we have problem A, we do here, and then we'll draw a little line here. We'll do problem B on the right-hand side. So let's first write down the hypothesis here. The null hypothesis for problem A is that, let's put some notation down, X shall be the weekly study time without lecture and tutorial attendance in hours, measured in hours, okay? And what we are after is that expected value, and we'll call that mu. This is what we are after. We want to know what is it in the population. So the null hypothesis for problem A is that that mean is equal to 24, and the alternative is that that mean is smaller than 24. So let's see, we're wondering in part A, has that mean dropped below the 2013 average of 24 hours? So two things, if you want to show something, then that claim, what you want to show potentially, needs to go into the alternative hypothesis because how hypothesis testing is set up is that the null hypothesis is sort of the default and you stick with the default unless you have enough evidence against it. And if you want to show it, you have to say, okay, I'll want to put the evidence on the table. So you put that claim into the alternative hypothesis. And also in the null hypothesis, we will always have the equal sign. And why that is, we'll see in a moment. So that's the hypothesis for part A. What about part B? So here, the null hypothesis is that the mean mu is equal to today's average of 14 hours and the alternative is that it is unequal to 14. Why is that? Because here we say in B it differs from today's national average. So it's not a question of is it larger or smaller, it's just is it different. So this is B is what we call a two-tailed test. A is a one-tailed test in particular because we are in the alternative looking at smaller than a left tail test. Now, you know, when we do hypothesis testing, you also need to set a significance level. Let's set that here in part A. We'll set that to, uh, let's say, 10%. And let's say in part B, we set that to 1%. So I'll just use different levels. So when we practice, we just see different levels you need to know that setting that alpha, the significance level, determines what probability you allow for a type 1 error to occur. Type 1 error is 
rejecting a correct null hypothesis. So that probability you control with the significance level. So the next thing you need to, to set is uh, the test statistic. We haven't looked at the sample yet. Right? So when you do hypothesis testing, you want to prepare an awful lot before you actually look at the sample. So the test statistic. We are testing for a population mean. And when you test for a population mean, the test statistic always looks like sample average minus the mean from the hypothesis. So that will be that 24 in a moment divided by the standard error of the sample mean. Now there are two ways to calculate that. Either sigma, the population standard deviation, divided by n, or s, the sample st standard deviation divided by n. Which of these two you use depends on what information you have. So the question is, in particular, do you know what the population standard deviation is? So if we go back to the question and we screen the question, but nothing in that question tells us anything about how x is distributed. Okay, how is x distributed in the population? We don't know. And we don't know what the variance of x is. Okay, because that is sigma squared, and we don't know what it is. So we cannot use this because we don't have the population standard deviation or variance. We have to approximate it with the sample standard deviation. So we can now complete our uh, test statistic. I'll write that away and write it down properly. So we have to use s divided by square root n. That is going to be our test statistic and it's going to be exactly the same over here. x bar minus mu here. Mu will be 14. You'll see that in a moment but we use exactly the same standard error for x bar. Whenever we use the sample estimate for the population standard deviation, we call this test a t-test. If you do have the sigma, we call this test statistic set. Okay. So next question is, how is this thing distributed? Because only once you know how this test statistic is distributed, then can you calculate a p-value? And why do we need a p-value? Because our decision rule is going to be reject h naught if the p-value is smaller than alpha. And that is exactly the same here. Reject h naught if the p-value is smaller than alpha. So we need to know that distribution. Remember, this test statistic is a random variable because we're having that x bar, that is a random variable. And in fact, that s is also a random variable. So therefore, the test statistic is a random variable. We need to know its distribution so we can calculate a p-value. And this is now often the most difficult part. We're almost halfway there. Now, before we get there, I want to tell you something about the data. So this is now the first time we actually look at the sample which we're going to take. Now, in this question, we are saying we're taking a random sample of 25 University of Manchester students. Now, what I actually did is in my class on Friday, I asked the students there and I didn't get 25 students, but I had 42 students. Mm -hmm. And we will look at the data in a moment. So we are having 42 students. So, how is that thing distributed? This is the most difficult question. Let me try and help you to figure that out. There are two ways, and in the video, in the notes to the video, you can link and see a link to the file. Two ways how we can think about determining that. Here's a little scheme. Now, this looks pretty complicated, and we'll walk through it. I'll have another tabular representation of that in a moment. But first, we got to figure out what information do we need to decide how that test statistic is distributed. And there are three bits of information we need. We need to know, or we need information on the distribution of x. In our case, okay, so what is that distribution? We want to figure out where do we get the variance of x from? Okay, is that either 
sigma squared or S squared sample estimate. Do we know it from the population or is it a sample estimate? And then we want to know whether N is large or not. And that is basically because in certain instances we may have to apply the central limit theorem and for that we need large enough N. So what do we know in our case? Well, in our case, we don't know how X is distributed. So in particular, we don't know that it's normally distributed. We don't know the population variance, so we have to use the sample variance. And then the question is, is N large or not? So, and that is for, you know, you have to think about for application of the center limit theorem, potentially. So in our case, we have a sample size of 42. Is that large enough to apply the central limit theorem or not? You will have perhaps read about the rule of thumb, which says if your sample size is larger than 30, you should be fine. Now, because it's a rule of thumb, that works often, but not always. There is nothing magic that happens once your sample goes to 30. A sample of 30 is only a little bit larger and better than a sample of 29. In particular, you that rule of thumb may not work if your distribution is extremely skewed. Now, if you have a very, very skewed distribution, then you may need larger sample sizes. But think about, so that's where you have to use a little bit of the knowledge of the problem. Think about the weekly study hours, and we'll think about a distribution, okay? If you think about how much students study, well, we said on that the average was 24 in 2013. So we'll possibly find many students, if I draw a density plot here, around 20, 24, fewer students doing, doing, doing less, and perhaps some students who do more, but, and perhaps that is a little bit skewed, but remember, it's impossible for a student, say, to study 2,000 hours a week because the week only has a limited number of hours. So while this may be skewed, it's not going to be extremely skewed. And we'll see some evidence actually from the sample in a moment. So we will decide here that 42 is possibly, will consider this large, okay? Because we're not dealing with, a, most likely not dealing with a very skewed distribution. So with this information under the belt, information about the distribution of X, about the variance of X and about the sample size. We can go to this little graph. So first step, investigate what you know about the random variable X. That's what we've done, okay? First question, do you know the population variance? In our case, no. That means you need to estimate the population variance with the sample variance S squared. We know that already, and therefore we use the T statistic. That is just a replication, it's pretty small here, of what we had before. It's x bar minus mu divided by s over square root n. Next question, is x normally distributed, yes or no? We don't know, so we have to decide no. If we said yes, then we would know that our test statistic would be t distributed. Okay, which of course the t distribution the larger the sample size, the closer it gets to the standard normal. But we decided no, so we go down here. Next question, is your sample large? Now, we decided for our purpose, the sample is large. Yes, we can apply the central limit theorem. So here we come to our conclusion. Our test statistic is standard normally distributed, thanks to the central limit theorem. So we will use the standard normal distribution to calculate our p-values. If here we had decided no, let's say we had a sample of 10 only, then we would have to conclude that our test statistic doesn't have a recognized distribution. And that means with the techniques we learn here, we cannot perform inference. Okay, but here fortunately, enough students turned up to my class and we can go to, to this. N01. There is, of course, a different question which we are not wondering here. If you if we go back to, to the question information, it says here we took a random sample of 
25 students. Now I said I took 42 students, students which came to my class. That is not necessarily a random sample anymore because the students who decide to come to my class, they are not random. They are not randomly deciding in the morning, flipping a coin, should I go to class or not. But there's some reason they decide, uh, they decide that. I like to think it's the very good students who do come to my class because they see the value. So we're not necessarily having a random sample. We will ignore this issue in this video. So we have now decided that, can we, let me get my favorite blue pen back, that we will use the standard normal distribution, actually on both occasions. So up to this, and that's why I draw a little line here, Okay, all of these things, basically almost all of them, we could decide without looking at our sample. The only thing we needed was the sample size. We needed to know how many, uh, how many students. Now I said this decision that this is a standard normal distribution. There's an alternative way you can think about that, and so I prepared an alternative table, which basically contains the same information. Okay, but it's perhaps just an alternative way to, to think about this. So we needed three things to decide the distribution of X, the variance of X, and the sample size, large or small. So we decided, and we use the red pen to exclude things here, we decided that our distribution, we couldn't say it's normal. So these cases, were not applicable to us. Then we didn't know sigma squared. So all of these cases here were out of the picture. That means there were only two cases left. They're down here. Okay, so what you see here is just combinations of these three pieces of information. And then we said that our sample is large for our purpose. So that one didn't apply. This left us with only one case. Okay, and what we had to do is we had to use the uh, T statistic, which uses the sample standard deviation. And the conclusion was that we use the standard normal distribution thanks to the CLT. That's, of course, exactly the same conclusion we came to here. Okay, both that little diagram and that table give you the same answer. So that, and a link to the file with both the table and the diagram is in the notes to this video, in the video description down below. All right, we are back here. Now we can actually do some work using our sample because we want to calculate our T statistic. So it's T is equal to the sample mean, we'll get that in a moment, and minus 24, divided by the sample standard deviation, we get that in a moment, divided by square root of 42. And over here, the same t statistic, t is equal to the sample mean minus, now not 24, but now it's minus 14, divided by the sample standard deviation, which we don't have yet, divided by square root 42. So you'll see for both of these tests, we will use exactly the same sample information and both these tests only differ in their hypotheses. So let's go to the actual observations. So here I have a, a file, Excel file with the responses. We have 24, 42 responses of how much do my students study. So these are real responses by my students. Whether they respond honestly, it's a different question. Okay. Oops. So firstly, let's calculate uh, X bar. And let's also calculate the standard deviation S. So that is the sample average of cells A2 to A42. Oh, sorry, A1 to A42. Here we go, 22.619. And the sample standard deviation is the sample standard deviation, again, from A1 to A42. 
is 10.0437. Now let's actually look at something else. So that's the information we need for the test. We'll go back to our test calculation. But let's actually quickly look at the distribution of these data in the sample. So I'll go to data analysis, histogram, uh, which data, well, all the data here to 42. I'll let the bins be chosen automatically. I want a chart output. And where do I want it? Um, let's put it in here. Okay, so here is the histogram. And what you can actually see is that in that sample of my 42 students, the distribution looks pretty symmetric and pretty, pretty normal. Okay. Now that information wasn't in the question. We could now think about is that strong enough evidence for us to claim that the that the population is normally distributed. And then we could change perhaps our path deciding the distribution of the test statistic. We're not going to do that here. No, we're not we will we will only be using that information here. Um, let me just copy that across. So let's go back to our working. So here was our X bar and the standard deviation. So we'll go back, we can now continue calculating our test statistic X bar was 22.619 here as well, 22.619. And the standard deviation was 10.043, so, so zero missing all point in here. I didn't leave myself enough space. 10.0437, 10.0437. Punching all this into your calculator, you realize that the test statistic here takes a value of, I'm just going to confirm that here, zero point eight nine one zero seven, and this one takes a value of 5.56. Let's just round to two, Diana, that's one, five. Here we go. 5.5615. So now we need to decide whether we want to reject or not reject the test statistic. We need to look at the p value because we need to see whether that is smaller than alpha or not to make this decision. Let's do a sketch. So here we'll start with a sketch for A. Our test statistic is a standard normally distributed test statistic. We called it T, but it was anyway standard normally distributed. Now well, that's what we use the central limit theorem to help us with. So that is of course centered around zero. Our test statistic is negative 0 0.89. So it's around here. So now we need to decide what's the p-value. Now importantly, what is the definition of the p-value? The p-value gives us the probability of getting an outcome as we did, i.e. a sample mean of 22.6, or more extreme, if the null hypothesis was true, so if the mean was really 24. So you can see actually that sample average of 22.6 isn't doesn't seem to be that far away from 24. So the question is how likely is it that we get such a mean or one more extreme if in truth the population mean is 24. What does more extreme mean? Well to define more extreme you need to go to the alternative hypothesis. We would reject if we found evidence that the mean is smaller than 24. We would get more evidence for that if we get smaller and smaller sample means. Now a sample mean of 22.6 gave us a t-statistic of 0.89. So that's the sample evidence we got. 
More extreme means smaller sample means, because we have a left-tailed hypothesis. Smaller sample means would give us a smaller t-statistic. So we are looking at values as we got this one, or more extreme, that means to the left here. The probability of getting these values is described by this area. Okay, that red area, this is the probability that we get a sample statistic as we did, or more extreme if the null hypothesis was true. So this is what we need. And we will be able to read that from the standard normal table. And we'll do that in a moment, but before we go to the table, we'll do this, the same thinking for part B. So let's sketch our test statistic. Well, that's not, not as nice, okay, but anyway, that's just a sketch. So here's our t-statistic centered around zero. Now our test statistic now is 5.56. That's very long in the tail, actually, 5.56. So how do we illustrate the p-value here? We want the probability of getting an outcome as we did in the sample, that's this one, or more extreme. Now, what does more extreme mean for part B? Again, we go to the alternative hypothesis to figure that out. Here we have a two-tailed alternative hypothesis. So more extreme means far away from 14, regardless of whether it's bigger or smaller. So far away. So we got something fairly far away from 14, right? 22.619 on the, on the right-hand side, so on being bigger. And that delivered a test statistic of 5.56. So if you got an even larger X bar, your test statistic T would become even larger. So it's either this or larger. But we are asking a two-tailed test. If we had the similar type of distance from 14 just on the left-hand side, we would also reject. So if you have a two-tailed test, you're not only looking at this probability here, but you're sort of also looking on the mirror, the probability on the mirror side, which would be negative 5.56 and to the left. Okay, because that evidence is just as extreme as the evidence which we got, which is this one here. So if you have a two-tailed test, you want the tail probabilities from both tails. Now, as we know that the probability in a standard normal distribution or the standard normal distribution is symmetric, we know that all we got to do is we need to calculate two times one of these tail probabilities uh, because these probabilities will be the same because we are having a symmetric distribution. So we just need to find one probability and then multiply it by two to get the p-value. What probabilities can we read from the standard normal table? We can read these sort of probabilities directly from the standard normal table. Okay, so we're gonna look at these probabilities. So let's get a normal table. Um, fortunately, I have one just handy. And if you study statistics, you should always have one handy. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's look at that left example first. We want to find the probability that Z is smaller or equal to negative 0.89. So negative. 0.8 is here and then 9 is the last column the second digit the 9 here so we're looking at the last column we're here that is the probability 0.1867 so this is 0.1867 that is the p-value so now we can decide because we know our p-value is 0.1867, so that's the p-value. Our alpha is, what did we set as alpha? 10%, 0.10. So we reject H0 if p-value is smaller. Is the p-value smaller than that? No, it's not. That means we do not reject. 
let's make sense of that. What did we calculate with that p-value? We said if the null hypothesis was true, if the mean was indeed 24, then there is an almost 18, 19% or let's say around 20% probability that we get a sample mean of 22.7 or more extreme or smaller. So that's a 20% probability. That is like one in five. That is a larger probability than rolling a dice and getting a six. And that happens all the time. So that is not a very small probability. That's not, that's quite likely to happen. And therefore the evidence which we got is not very strong evidence against the null hypothesis that in the population, the students in Manchester actually do study on average 24 hours a week. So well done, you students. Good work. Keep up the good work. OK. So we do not reject H0. Now let's go to part B, problem B, where we are testing a different hypothesis. Is, we're basically testing whether the sample average is different from 14. Well, let's look at the data here. We want to find the size of that, um, of that tail, negative 5.56. So let's go to the normal table. Here's the normal table, negative 5.56. You see that table only goes to negative 309. That is the smallest value we can get from that table. And there the probability is, the tail probability is 0 0.001. So let me just use a different color here. So we know if we go to this value here, negative 3.09, we know that that area, the gray area, the gray area is 0 0.001. That means the red area, we don't know an exact value for it, but we know it's smaller than 0 0.001. That means the p-value, all we know from looking at the table is that the p-value is smaller than, remember, two times that area. So it would be smaller than two times 0, 0, 0, 0001, which is 0 0.002. So all we know is that the p-value is smaller than 0 0.002. It's possibly quite a lot smaller because 5 negative 5.56 is still a long way from negative 3.09. It doesn't matter. So the p-value is 0 point smaller than 0 0.002. What was the alpha? In this case, we set the alpha to 1%, 0 0.01. So again, is this smaller? Yes, it is smaller for sure. Whatever it is precisely, the maximum value it could possibly be is 0 0.002, and even that is smaller than 1%. So here we do reject H0. So what does that mean? Our null hypothesis asked whether the population mean was different to 14, and the answer is yes. We gathered a lot of evidence to suggest that on average, students um, in Manchester study more than 14 hours a week because the probability of getting the evidence we got, 22.7, or more extreme or further away from 14, is less than, way less actually than 0 0.002. So that is very unlikely. So that makes it very unlikely that in the population the mean is indeed 14. Okay, let me just briefly recap what we've done here. We've done two hypothesis tests, both based on the same sample evidence, just differing in the hypothesis. It was population, it was a test on the population mean. And the difficult bit when you do these tests is actually deciding what's the test statistic and how is it distributed. And to help you with that, we presented the two different ways to go about it, a sort of little graphical decision tree scheme or a table which you can use because there are basically eight 
possibilities. And these possibilities, actually, I could just summarize that here. Let me do that in, uh, in green. There are three possible outcomes, or no, actually four possible outcomes here. Well, in the end, as possibly less. So either we use the normal distribution, that's these three outcomes here, however we get there using a central limit theorem or not, normal distribution, just like we did now, or you use the T distribution, which are these outcomes, or there are two possible outcomes where you can't just, just can't perform the inference with the traditional techniques we learned here, because you don't know how the test statistic is distributed at. And these are the cases where the distribution, we cannot claim that the distribution is normal and we're having small samples. All right, so that leads to cases where you can't perform inference with the techniques which we learn here.